Hello, I'm Roger McIntyre, Professor of Psychiatry and Pharmacology at the University of Toronto. I'm head of the Mood Disorder Psychopharmacology Unit. I'm also the Executive Director of the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation. Thank you for joining me for today's module entitled The Pharmacological Treatment of Mood Disorders, Optimizing Treatment to Achieve the Best Outcomes. Let's start off with the learning objectives. I want to, in fact, really discuss the importance of early optimization of treatment. We really, in fact, have got to make the diagnosis timely and accurately. We have to have the initiation of guideline informed treatments with measurement, and we have to optimize treatment early because there is a window of opportunity in achieving best outcomes in major depression. We're going to discuss what are the probabilistic factors or what factors really give us information as to whether we're on the right track with the treatment we're going to select or we have selected. And I'm going to share with you results of the recently published USA Medicaid guidelines from the state of Florida that provide for us decision support in improving outcomes in people with depression where tremendous emphasis has been placed on early optimization, emphasis on function, and also on measurement of these uh, types of symptom outcomes in depression. I want to start off, if I can, with just a reminder. Depression, we know, is a common and costly disorder. This is the first time in humanity where advances in technology and productivity are not increasing workplace opportunity. They're decreasing workplace opportunity. Historically, through the agricultural and industrial revolution, we saw an increase in workplace, uh, which was, in fact, commensurate with an increase in technology. So the digital revolution is changing the entire uh, uh, demand of the workplace looking for greater cognitive capital. Uh, to have a job around the world, it is in fact preferred to have complex cogn cognitive skill sets that in fact are not routine as opposed to the simple and manual. And this is really changing the economic implications of brain-based disorders. Simply put, depression is expensive and the implications are it's going to be more expensive as diseases of cognition and brain uh, capital continue in fact to be overrepresented amongst disabling conditions in humanity. We know that depression is a very, very common condition, and we know that there are multiple dimensions that affect health outcome, mood, behavioral, and cognitive. I want to just very briefly mention that in depression, it's turning out more and more that the cognitive dimension for many patients is a principal determinant of health outcome. Individuals who have, in fact, depression have significant reductions in cognitive performance, and the reduction meets and exceeds what's considered to be the benchmark of deficit, that is, greater than 0.2 effect size deficit. Recently, our colleagues in Cleveland and uh, here in Toronto uh, published a paper showing that amongst adults who have depression, who are trying to work, what determines their workplace attendance and productivity is not so much how severe the depression is, but in fact, how well they're performing cognitively. And this is really something we've seen in bipolar, and schizophrenia for many years, and we're only now recently seeing this in the area of major depression, really underscoring how important cognition is. In addition to identifying all the dimensions and domains of depression, we have to recognize that there's a window of opportunity. And as the illness progresses in time and failed treatments, we see diminished treatment outcomes. STAR-D showed this very clearly, that with each treatment failure, the probability for success decreases. This is why it's so important to make the diagnosis early, timely, and accurately, and to give people the best treatments, that is the treatments with the greatest therapy, therapeutic potential, right out of the gate, rather than waiting till later on because the illness is progressive. This is the window of opportunity. Now, there's been many lines of evidence that support this concept of the window of opportunity. For example, when you look at the duration of untreated episode, DUE, which is in the current uh, uh, figure, what you see is that the probability of sustained remission and response is significantly lower in people who've had a longer duration of untreated episode when people have had a shorter duration of untreated episode. Again, speaks to the progression, speaks to the need for detecting, diagnosing, and initiating and optimizing treatment early on, recognizing that this is in fact a, a very progressive process. Many colleagues around the world have told me that they tend to keep some of the more robust or more reliable treatments until other treatments maybe have failed. Keep in mind that this progression of illness that we see is apparent from the very first episode of illness. And in fact, not achieving remission from the first episode or after multiple episodes results in a more unfavorable illness trajectory in depression. We've got to get these persons treated, 
treat it to full symptomatic remission, not just mood symptoms, but the physical symptoms and the cognitive symptoms. This is the first step towards full functional recovery. Earlier I had mentioned that people who have a longer duration of untreated episode have a much lower probability of sustained response and remission. We've also learned that people who have a longer duration of the disorder have in fact much lower functional outcomes. We want not just symptomatic improvement, we want functional recovery. And the longer the illness goes on, the lower the likelihood we're going to achieve what patients and society hopes for, that being in fact full functional recovery. I've mentioned throughout many modules in this series that depression is in fact a progressive illness and in addition to seeing increased episode frequency with each episode people have had, we see decreases in cognitive performance with each episode of illness. So we want to optimize treatment early on and we want to keep people functionally recovered because not only do symptoms predispose and portend relapse and recurrence, but Decreases in functioning also increase the likelihood of relapse and recurrence. We also know with each episode in recurrence, uh, relapse and recurrence, there's a greater likelihood people are going to have problems with cognition, like memory function. So this really speaks to the point that this illness of depression is certainly highly associated with neurodegenerative progression. In addition to disturbances in memory, we see sustained deficits in processing speed amongst individuals who are in remission after multiple episodes. This is a scarring effect of depression. So we in fact have a window of opportunity to get this diagnosis made accurately, give people treatments that are capable of suppressing and symptoms and resulting in full multi-dimensional remission, achieving full functional recovery to reduce the risk of relapse and recurrence and reduce the scarring effect of cognitive impairment like memory in processing speed deficits. The fact is, is for a variety of reasons, people do not receive appropriate treatment. In fact, less than 10% of people with depression and bipolar are receiving optimal treatments for their condition. And with each episode that they have, they increase the likelihood of future episodes, chronicity, treatment resistance, as well as in fact suicidality. It's absolutely essential to really in fact start with treatment uh, strategies that have the greatest therapeutic potential. This is not confined to pharmacotherapy. In many cases this could be a lifestyle, a behavioral change. It could be manual based psychotherapy like cognitive behavioral therapy. It could in fact involve in some cases pharmacotherapy as well. Each patient is different and every treatment uh, plan has to be personalized to that individual. We believe that if we can make that diagnosis, optimize treatment early on, informed by best available evidence, we can increase the likelihood that patients will have a full functional recovery. And once you function better, it reduces the risk of relapse and recurrence. Let me also in fact remind you that patients who function better have better antidepressant outcomes than patients who don't function as well. So differently, too many times what we do is we, we expect the functioning to improve because the symptoms are improving, and that's true. But keep in mind that if we target the function and target the symptoms contemporaneously at the same time, that gives patients the best chance for success. That's why I believe that patients need behavioral activation. They need to, in fact, have daily rhythms structured. There needs, in fact, to be engagement physically, that is through exercise, and cognitive engagement through tasks and activities, along with seeing a therapist for manual-based psychotherapy and where appropriate pharmacotherapy to give people the best chance for success. And if we can do that, I think full functional recovery is a realistic objective that many patients expect and I think deserve. The best predictor of outcome as to whether or not I've chosen the right treatment for my patient is how well they're doing in the first two to three weeks. This has been an observation in generalized anxiety disorder, in schizophrenia, in bipolar mania and depression, and also in major depressive disorder. It's a phenomenon in psychiatry that how you're doing in the first two to three, two to four weeks gives us the best indicator whether I'm on the right track. If patients are not doing well in the first two to, two to four weeks, that is they're not having any symptomatic improvement or minimal improvement, I would optimize my treatment intensity. This is why it's so important to have early optimization of therapy early on in the treatment course. Let me share if I can with you the recently published Florida Medicaid guidelines for the treatment of mood disorders. 
these are the most up-to-date guidelines we have that in fact look at algorithms for informing treatment in both major depression and bipolar. These guidelines were authored not only by academics but also by clinicians, individuals in advocacy, policy uh, experts, folks who are experts in treatment options, as well as many systems and actuarial experts. Let's start off if we can with acute bipolar depression. The pharmacological treatment of acute bipolar depression has to begin with what are the therapeutic objectives to achieve full response, remission, and functional recovery. The treatments that have been suggested first are quetiapine or lorazodone monotherapy. I also want to state that I recognize that not all these two treatments are available throughout the world. Lorazodone is also recommended as a treatment in adjunct to lithium or divalproics, products where lorazodone is available. Lorazodone has a more favorable tolerability profile, specifically metabolic and weight gain, than does quetiapine. That being said, quetiapine has been shown to be effective in bipolar II depression, while other treatments have not been studied sufficiently in bipolar II depression. Failing first-line therapy, 1A therapy, 1B, would, or sorry, level 2A, would recommend olanzapine fluoxetine combination. Again, this is a, where this is available. Why this treatment's been demoted to 2A is because of the propensity to weight gain and metabolic change. Level 2B treatments were lithium and lamotrigine. In failing this, we have various combinations of the atypical with lithium and lamotrigine. Level 3 therapy was electroconvulsive therapy, and level 4 therapy is a variety of treatments like antidepressants, where appropriate psychostimulants, and other agents like Premapexol. Other neuromodulatory approaches like TMS are also in fact reserved for level 4 treatment. Again, these algorithms can be attained from the reference at the bottom of the slide. For acute mania, first-line therapies with lithium uh, or with an atypical antipsychotic. In severe conditions, the combination of lithium or divalproex with an atypical antipsychotic is recommended. If insufficient, we recommend switching to an alternative atypical antipsychotic agent and various combinations of lithium or an anticonvulsant like divalproex with an atypical antipsychotic. Level 3 therapy would involve clozapine or electroconvulsive therapy or various combinations of the various treatments I've already mentioned. For continuation and maintenance therapy, I'd ask you to refer to the Florida guidelines which can be obtained from the URL at the bottom of the slide free of charge or from the recent publication in Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. Simply put, what tends to get you well with bipolar tends to keep you well, and the dose and where applicable plasma levels that get you well also seem to be what keeps you well. There are exceptions to that, and I'd encourage you to read that in the document. In major depressive disorder, there are a variety of first-line therapies. Medication would be sine qua non, absolutely necessary in bipolar, but in many patients with major depression, manual-based psychotherapy like CBT or IPT would be appropriate. In other cases, an antidepressant would be a first-line strategy. We have SSRIs, SNRIs like venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, more recently levomilnasopran, and duloxetine. We also have in some countries bupropion, velazidone, agomelatine, meclobamide, which is the reversal inhibitor of amino oxidase. When we talk about other treatments that are available, we also have 40-oxetine, and 40-oxetine has been studied. It's a multimodal agent that's also been shown to be effective in treating cognitive symptoms in depression. If there's not sufficient response after two to four weeks, we suggest optimizing the dose. You have to optimize dose to achieve full functional recovery and, in fact, take advantage of the recognized window of opportunity. Failing first-line therapy, we would recommend perhaps an alternative first-line therapy after full optimization. If switching to an alternative first-line therapy is not sufficient, you could also consider augmentation or adding an atypical agent like where available, aripiprazole, brexpiprazole, quetiapine, or olanzapine. Again, priority given to those agents that are in fact not uh, more likely to cause weight gain liability. Obviously, in someone who's got a very severe condition, we uh, tend to in fact think about ECT earlier in the treatment course, but ECT is typically reserved for level three therapy for patients who have major depression. 
Again, I'd refer you to the Florida guidelines for full details of this information, but I really wanted to emphasize the importance of early optimization in measuring symptoms with a measurement-based tool, as well as measuring their cognition with the Think It tool, and also their functional outcomes with a, uh, either a general functional measure or a self-rated functional measure. What about major depressive disorder or depressive episodes with mixed features? This is a new nosological entity in DSM-5. This could apply to either major depression or bipolar disorder. About 25 to 30 percent of patients with major depression have mixed features. Well, it hasn't been sufficiently studied, but we do know that many of these persons do very well when treated with an atypical or a mood stabilizer like lithium or lamotrigine. That doesn't mean that they have bipolar. They could have unipolar illness. We, in fact, as part of the guideline process, did not recommend against using antidepressants. They're still first-line therapy, but be very vigilant for any clinical presentation that is suggestive of bipolar disorder, because we know that people who have subsyndromal hypomanic symptoms or subthreshold hypomania while going through a depressive episode have a risk for uh, uh, really unblinding or sort of unmasking, so to, so to speak, uh, bipolar disorder. Keep in mind that mixed features are not synonymous with bipolar, but they are more common in people who have bipolar illness. So taken together, a, in quotes, mood stabilizing strategy, like an atypical or lithium or lamotrigine, may be a viable first line agent for some of these agents, uh, persons. And then finally, uh, conventional antidepressants could also be considered uh, herein. I will not review the level two and level three strategies, I, in fact, would recommend you read uh, the guidelines on the URL or the more recently published guideline. Finally, with psychosis as part of depression, a combination of an antipsychotic with an antidepressant is the standard of care and or use of ECT, and that has not changed in these more recent guidelines. To summarize, we know that depression is indeed a progressive condition. We strongly recommend early optimization of therapy because there is a window of, uh, of opportunity here uh, insofar as the likelihood of symptomatic remission and full functional recovery decreases as the illness, in fact, increases in its duration, as episode frequency goes up, and the number of failed treatments also increases. Early optimization of therapy focuses on symptoms and focuses on function. It also, in fact, uh, implies you're measuring your symptoms with a a measurement tool like the PHQ-9 or the QUIDS, for example, and also increasingly measuring other domains like anxiety, sleep, cognition, as well as function. We also, in fact, have, uh, during this program, uh, introduced you all to the recently published Medicaid Florida guidelines for major depression and bipolar. I'd encourage you to have a look at those on the URL, the recent publication, to receive more detailed and granular recommendations as it's been shown that measurement-based care, as well as using decision support like guidelines enhances the precision, the consistency, the appropriateness, and the cost effectiveness of care. With that, I'll stop there and I'll look forward to seeing you during one of our other modules.